It's a joy. It truly is a joy to worship with the people of God. Brethren, I would ask you to open up your Bibles to the book of Mark as we continue our series verse by verse, word for word, through this precious gospel. Uh, we're going to be in Mark chapter 1 as we continue on. We're going to find ourselves in verse 14. We're going to look at two verses, verses 14 and 15. I've told you before, I want to keep a good pace through this book, but when I stumbled upon these two verses, found that they would be the next two that I was going to preach on, I could not take any more on my plate. There's so much truth packed in these two verses. So therefore, that is what we're going to consider this morning. Um, I will read it, and then I will pray, and we will uh, get into our, our study of the Word of God together. So Mark writes these words in verse 14. He says, Now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Let's pray. Father, now as I stand before your people, which is a terrifying task to preach your word. I pray for grace, for wisdom, and for a deep understanding of the truths that I am seeking to convey this morning. Father, in my weakness, I pray that your power would be perfected. And I pray for the hearers, O oh God, that you would, you would work on the hearts of those who hear these truths propounded in this sermon, who hear the truth of the gospel brought forth. I pray for the believers in here that they would be grown in grace, that they would be grown in knowledge of the truth of Scripture, that they themselves might be able to disciple others and preach the gospel to the lost. And Father, I pray for unconverted souls in this place, souls that are filthy, that are clothed in the garments of their sin. Oh God, I pray that You would save them, that You would regenerate their hearts, Father, that You'd raise them to spiritual life, that You would quicken them by Your Spirit. And above all else, it is my prayer that in the preaching of the Word of God, Christ would be glorified and Christ would be honored. And in each of our lives, Christ would be glorified forever. Amen. Amen and amen. Truly one of the greatest things that God has ordained to come about in His church is the preaching of the Word of God. There is nothing quite as important when it comes to the health of the church as preaching and we see this not only in the church, but even in Old Testament days, that, that God raised up prophets were, were, who were in themselves preachers, men who expounded the truth of God with boldness and fervency. And when we examine these men's lives and the messages that they conveyed, we see a lot about what they had to say and even who the men were. And it is likewise the same with our Lord Jesus Christ. In His preaching ministry, we see a lot concerning what Jesus uh, believed concerning the Father and believed concerning salvation. Really, we could say it's the gospel according to Jesus, what Jesus' teaching was concerning salvation and concerning the kingdom of God and His fulfillment of Messianic prophecies. In fact, we find in the four gospels, in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, a detailed record of the preaching ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there we learn many things about God and salvation and how we ought to live a righteous life, even things about the life of a believer. Even the most famous sermon that Jesus preached, His Sermon on the Mount, was really a sermon about, about it was for people, the people of God. It wasn't necessarily an evangelistic sermon, although it definitely had parts in it that were evangelistic. The main thrust of it was for the people of God. And so, brethren, these things are for us to come and to grab hold of in Scripture. The preaching of Jesus is something that we ought to examine, that we ought to sit under all the days of our lives. There are many preachers, many great preachers, men like Dr. MacArthur and uh, Dr. R.C. Sproul, uh, or even historically speaking, as a friend of mine told me um, yesterday, the dead are the better, uh, men like John Flavel, George Whitfield, Ch John Calvin, Martin Luther, and other preachers, Charles Spurgeon, but I say that we, we should sit under these men. We should listen to their preaching. But higher than that, we ought to sit under the, the chief master preacher, the king of preachers, the preacher himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And in so doing, we will learn great truths. We will gather jewels that we will carry with, our, with us for the rest of our lives and ultimately into eternity. That will bring our souls into eternity. For I say there is no greater place that the gospel is brought forth than in the preaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is why Mark could write here in Mark 1.14 that Christ preached the gospel of God. That was the main thrust of our Lord's preaching. And that's what I want us to consider this morning as we look at these two verses. And before we do that, I would like, of course, to consider our context. Where Paul, where, excuse me, not Paul, but where Mark has taken us already and where he is eventually going to take us in this chapter, chapter 1. We have already seen in Mark 1 the beginning of John the Baptist's ministry. We saw that in verses 2 through 8. What John had to say in his preaching, and he is a great man we ought to sin under. In fact, Jesus proclaimed upon John the Baptist. He said he is really the culmination of the Old Testament prophets. In fact, he said there is no one greater among the children of men than John the Baptist. True, and his preaching was indeed Christ exalting. In fact, he said in verse 7, After me one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and to untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. His preaching was Christ exalting. And then after that, as Mark continues in his narrative, we find the beginning of Jesus' ministry in verses 9 through 13. And we considered last week that it was marked by two main events according to Mark's narrative. Firstly, it was marked by Jesus' baptism. And then secondly, it was marked by Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. Or you could say that period of fasting where he was in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. But then we find after that, that Jesus comes into Galilee. He comes into the place where he was going to spend most the rest of his ministry And he came preaching. And he came preaching with power from on high. For we saw in the previous verses that the Spirit of God descended from heaven as a dove. Christ's ministry was Spirit empowered. And so here he comes, fresh out of this time of temptation and trial in the wilderness, these 40 days, and having defeated the enemy. Having resisted to the uttermost something that none of us have the full power to do, He did it with perfection. And so therefore, He has this fresh power from on high upon Him, and He comes preaching with that power from on high. So let us consider the preaching of Jesus in these two verses. (laughs) Firstly, I want us to see in verse 14, and this is my first point I would like to make, and that is that His preaching was gospel-centered, that it was gospel-centered, Pay attention with me to verse 14, if you will. Mark writes, Now after John had been taken into custody. Now we will stop right there. Before I get to the main point of this verse, I would like to consider the background to John and why John was thrown in prison. If you'd briefly turn with me to Mark chapter 6. And this is actually after Mark has been, uh, excuse me, after John has been thrown into prison. But listen to the way John dies. He dies as a preacher of righteousness. In verse 17 it says, For Herod had sinned and had John arrested and bound in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herod had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. And could not do so, for Herod was afraid of John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. And when he heard him, he was very perplexed, but he used to enjoy listening to him. And in the next few verses, we find a narrative of where, because of Herod's immorality and sexual perversion, that he ended up doing that which he did not actually want to do, which was kill John the Baptist. But it's interesting to note, going back to Mark chapter 1, that the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ did not hinge upon John's ministry. The purposes of God, the chief purposes that God had, did not hinge upon one man. And that is a truth that we ought to take into our hearts and into our minds. We ought to remember that we are not indispensable. That we ourselves, God does not need us. God does not need me. God does not need the greatest of preachers upon the earth. For God can raise up stones to give His name glory. 
God can cause the trees to speak the gospel if He so desires to. God does not need any man. And therefore, when when a servant of God is persecuted or brought out of the ministry, God's purposes have not been thwarted. For we know God is working all things according to His sovereign decree. God is working things according to His purposes. And therefore, if one of His servants is persecuted and taken out of the ministry, it was according to His purposes. And we ought to find a great satisfaction in that, knowing the sovereignty of God. But it was also fitting that John's ministry should end at this point. Why? Because Jesus' ministry had thus begun. The preaching of John the Baptist had served its purpose. He had prepared the hearts of Israel for the coming of Messiah. The people had heard the preaching of John and they knew that Messiah was coming. They knew that the King of the Kingdom of God was going to reign. Was going to set up His... Not a kingdom of this world, but a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of the people of God. And therefore, John's ministry came to a close. It had served its purpose. And there we find the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Because the next phrase in verse 14 of Mark 1 reads, Jesus came into Galilee. As I said earlier, this place, Galilee which was in the northernmost point of Israel in Jesus' day, and was actually the most populous, was where Jesus was going to spend most of His ministry, most of His preaching, most of His miracles were done around this place. In fact, a lot of important and strategic events in Jesus' ministry took place around what is called the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias. Obviously, the most famous being that when Jesus walked on the water, And Peter stepped out as well, walking on the water. I'm sure you're familiar with narrative and the story that is put forth in the Gospels. That happened there on the Sea of Galilee. In fact, it's interesting to note that the word Galilee is used in all four Gospels at a combined time of 57 times. And uh, we're going to see that, I'm sure, used again later on in the book of Mark multiple times because it is a great focal point of our Lord's ministry. But here is what I want to pay most attention to here in verse 14. And it is the last phrase. It simply reads, preaching the gospel of God. As I said earlier, the means that God, one of the means God uses to get the gospel to the lost is preaching. And so it is therefore imperative that our Lord be a master of it. And He truly was. There is no greater preacher. Any preacher every preacher pales in comparison to how well Christ was in His exposition of God's truth. But specifically, at the end of that phrase, it says, the gospel of God. He was preaching the good news, the euangelion of God, the good tidings of God. That's an interesting phrase, and it's used elsewhere in Scripture. In Romans chapter 1, verse 1, Paul says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Later, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 11.7, he says, Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you without charge? There he's speaking to to the Corinthians and defending his apostolic character. But he uses that phrase, gospel of God. Even Peter, in agreement with Paul in 1 Peter 4.17, writes, For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God, and if it begins with us first... What will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? What is this phrase? What does this mean? Well, it denotes three things concerning God in relation to His gospel. Firstly, it is His ownership of it. Secondly, His authorship of it. And thirdly, the content of it. So firstly, the ownership. The gospel is something which God possesses. It is His possession. That is why Paul says in Galatians 1, if any man tampers with this gospel, if any man distorts or changes this gospel, let him be anathema. Let him be accursed. Why? Because it is God's ownership and it is God's prerogative. He says what he desires to be done with his gospel and it ought not be changed. The gospel that Jesus died and was buried and was raised on the third day ought not be changed. It ought not be moved to the left or to the right. We have many today Many so-called preachers who stand in pulpits and try to expound their own version of a gospel 
And I say a gospel is certainly not the gospel, and they thereby offend God. And they kindle His wrath against them because it is not the true gospel. And it is not His gospel. Secondly, this phrase denotes... Or firstly, it denotes ownership. Secondly, it denotes authorship. The gospel is something which has protruded out of the brilliance and wisdom of God. Brethren, when we think about Christ's work at the cross, when we think about the atonement of Christ, when we think about the satisfaction that He provided for us, that He propitiated the wrath of the Father, we see the brilliance of God. We see the power of God. We see the grace and holiness of God. In fact, Paul himself said at the end of 1 Corinthians that Christ is the wisdom of God unto us. Mm, it indeed, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of God is a revelation of the brilliance of God. When we consider other religions and other belief systems around the world, none of them possess what Scripture preaches and what Scripture brings forth. This truth of propitiation, this truth of salvation through the blood of the mediator. There's nothing else like it in any other religion. It is unique. It is glorious. And it is something that the mind of man did not come up with. It is not something that preachers in the 17th century came up with. Not something that reformers came up with. Not something that Augustine came up with. It was something that protruded out of the mind of God. So, the phrase gospel of God denotes ownership, authorship, and thirdly, Content. The content of the gospel is about God. The gospel is not about you and I, brethren. It brings to us great glorious gifts. It truly does. The gospel makes us rich in spiritual things. The gospel brings to us eternal redemption. But the gospel is Trinitarian. The gospel is theocentric. The gospel is about the triune God redeeming His own people by His own grace and for His own glory. It is not about man. It is about God ordering the economy of salvation in such a way that He might bring glory to His name. That's why earlier I said the Gospel, what the content of it is, is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Notice, no mention of you. Notice, no mention of me. Notice, no mention of any man. It's Christ, the mediator. That's why Paul later on in 1 Corinthians 15, which we will consider later, says, this Gospel which I preach to you, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. What is that? I hear no word of man. I, have no, I hear no word of the work of man. I hear no word of prosperity. I hear no word of health and wealth and happiness. I hear no word of a, Roll, a Rolls Royce or a private jet. All I hear is a word of the Savior laying His life down as the shepherd for the sheep to redeem them from their sin. That is the content of the Gospel. And that is why Paul and Peter and Mark, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, wrote, it is the Gospel of God. It is owned by God. It is authored by God. And it is, the content is about God. In fact, brethren, we would do well to always consider this fact that God is for God. God is not for us. Now, you may think, what? What? He is, certainly. But I'm talking in the overarching working of God's eternal plan. Even in His being for us, even above that, that is Him being for Himself because He's bringing glory to Himself through being for us. Through saving His people, God is bringing glory to Himself. That's why in Isaiah, He expressed a great zeal for His own glory. For He said, I will not give My glory to another and therefore, God is jealous for the glory. And that is why it is our chiefest end to bring God glory. In fact, that's exactly what the Baptist Catechism says. Ch uh, question two. What is the chief end of man? Answer. The, the, a man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That is our end. And we do well to serve that glorious purpose. To give God the glory in all that we do. And so that is the first point. That the gospel, and Jesus' preaching specifically, was gospel-centered. Now let us continue on chronologically as we find ourselves moving on into verse 15. It says, And saying, The time is fulfilled. Now we will simply stop right there. 
Jesus is simply saying that the fullness of the times has come upon us. Right now is the right time. We think about why didn't Christ come earlier in history? Or why why didn't Christ choose to come later in history? It is because in the mind of God, when Christ came, was the perfect time. It was the absolute perfect time. In fact, Paul later relates this idea in the book of Galatians, in Galatians 4.4. He says, in verse 3, he says, So we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. Verse 4, But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, that He might redeem those who were born under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. Brethren, Christ came at the perfect time. It was the time that the Father had sent at eternity past. In His divine prerogative, it was the perfect timing for Christ to come into the world. For the prophets, for the Psalms, had proclaimed His coming. John the Baptist, as we just discussed a moment ago, Proclaimed His coming. And therefore, now He comes. Also this phrase, the time is fulfilled, has reference and it carries with it the concept that Christ is declaring that He is the fulfillment of all Messianic prophecies. In effect, He is saying here, I am the Messiah. I am the one who has come to fulfill the prophecies that were written in the Old Covenant Scriptures. In fact, we know uh, if, if we do a little bit of math, from the Old Testament, Christ fulfilled over 400 prophecies in His life, which of course, as we know, is a mathematical impossibility for anyone else. And truly, that speaks to the brilliance and power of God. In fact, we remember, if you remember last week, I took you to Luke 4, where Jesus went into the synagogue in Nazareth, and He read that section out of Isaiah 61 and said to the people that this has been fulfilled in your hearing. And they were shocked. They were astounded. In fact, it talks about how they took offense. And he even said later on that a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown amongst his own people. And obviously the Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, make reference and make mention various times when Jesus did different things or said different things. Or upon the cross, we see in John 19 that John makes note of where Jesus fulfilled various prophecies. Matthew is the most, uh, is the most detailed when it comes to Christ's fulfillment of prophecy. I'd encourage you, brethren, if you would like a, an understanding of Jesus in terms of Old Testament Scriptures, I would encourage you to go to Matthew Because Matthew just constantly is picking Old Testament passages and pointing to the fact that Christ has fulfilled them. When we think about our Jewish friends who have yet to experience the saving grace of Christ, who do not receive Him as Messiah, who reject Him, who reject His saving grace, who find themselves to be enemies of God and not in the covenant of grace, not in this new covenant. Firstly, we ought to pity them and pray for them. But we should take them to the Old Testament text. We should take them to Isaiah 11. We should take them to Isaiah 53. We should take them to Isaiah 61. We should take them to other places, to the Psalms, Psalm 22. We should take them to Genesis 3, right there, where God promises the soul, excuse me, the skull crushing seed of the woman. All of Scripture is as one chorus crying out together that Jesus Christ is Lord. And specifically, the Old Testament is pointing to that. And so Christ steps on the scene with authority. There's such an authority here with what He says. The time is fulfilled. This is set in stone. I'm Messiah. It's fulfilled. And I'm coming to save my people from their sins. In fact, I love at the end of Matthew 7, right after Jesus preaches His most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, it says that the people were astounded because He was preaching as one who had authority. And not like their scribes. Do mm. you want preaching? You want to hear preaching with authority? Don't listen to me. Listen to Christ. Listen to His preaching. The all, only authority a preacher has is the authority that is found in Scripture. I have nothing to say to you apart from Holy Scripture. I have nothing to say to you apart from the Word of God, from Holy Writ. There is nothing else for me to get up here and say. And so Christ comes in with this authority. Authority. 
this holy authority as the king and says, it has been fulfilled. And so that is the second point. Thirdly, I would like to consider that Christ's preaching was concerning the kingdom of God. And that is found in the next part of verse 15, which he says, And the kingdom of God is at hand. Christ's preaching, as you probably have recognized in your studying of the Gospels, was very centered around this idea of the kingdom of God, or as Jesus sometimes used the phrase, kingdom of heaven. What does this mean when he says kingdom of God? Well, we certainly know that it is not an earthly kingdom. It is not a kingdom that is of this world. In fact, he told Pilate, he said, my kingdom is not of this world, otherwise my servants would be fighting. Otherwise they'd be fighting for me to be freed. It's a, it's a spiritual kingdom, we understand that. But the Jewish people had very a very hard time understanding that. See, culturally, uh, uh, the background to what Jesus is saying here, we have to consider what was going on in the first century. Well, the Jewish people were aching to hear the Messiah. They were. They wanted to hear about the Messiah. They did. Even, even the scribes and Pharisees, they were looking for Messiah. Then we say, you say, well, Lucas, why did they reject Messiah? Why did they reject Christ? It is because they had a wrong view of who Messiah was. They had a wrong view. They thought that when the Messiah came, He was going to set up a kingdom in Israel. He was going to reign on an actual earthly monarchy. And He was going to destroy the Romans and destroy their enemies. And they were going to actually physically reign with the king. And so Christ comes in, this carpenter, this suffering servant, this humble man, this poor carpenter, he's the king. And so they took offense at him. In fact, if you go down and study history and you look at the first century, I found this to be quite astounding and I didn't realize this until I studied it last night, was that in the first century there were many messianic figures like Jesus that appeared. There were many. There were, uh, time and time again, there would be guys who would rise up and they'd say, I'm Messiah. And then they, but here's the difference. Here's the difference between them and Christ. There was actually a lot of differences. But one of the main differences was this. Every time one of those supposed messianic figures would, be, uh, would rise up, it was always a rebellion. They would, they would get a band of men together and they would go and try to fight the Romans, and set up a kingdom, an actual physical kingdom in Israel, trying to destroy the Roman Empire and, and reign on earth physically. And guess what happened every time? They lost, they died, and the movement went away. And that's really what the Jewish people were looking for, was some, was some warrior coming. And we know He is coming. He's coming to wage war. Christ is coming. If you're not born again, Christ is coming to destroy the wicked. And you will be a recipient of His wrath. You have to have salvation in Christ alone. But as I was saying... Christ comes along and He's not a warrior king in that sense. He's, at this point in his, his first advent, He's a suffering servant. He's laying His life down as the shepherd for the sheep. And so they took offense at Him. But this kingdom of God, this kingdom of God that's referenced, and later on in Ephesians 5.5, 5, Paul talks about the kingdom of Christ and of God. So of course we know this is Christ's kingdom as well. If it's the Father's, it's Christ's. This kingdom of God, what he's referencing here is the spiritual reign and rule of God in the hearts of the people of God. Brethren, right now we're in the kingdom of God. Right now we're in the United States, yes, but we are in the kingdom of God. If you're in Christ, if you're born again, you're in the kingdom of God. And if you're not born again, if you're lost, then you're outside of that and you're an enemy of the kingdom of God. You're an enemy of God. And he's going to wage war against you in the coming of Christ. We see that Christ is coming as a warrior king. Revelation 19. An eye, eyes with flame of fire. A head with, uh, on his head is many diadems. He has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. His clothed with a robe dipped in blood. He's coming. He's coming. And he's going to destroy the enemies of God. And so when he uses this phrase here, kingdom of God, he's referencing the spiritual reign and rule of God in the hearts of the people of God. The, the kingdom of God uh, it also has two, really two senses in Scripture. 
One, the one I just gave. This present reality, it's in the hearts of all the people of God. But secondly, secondly, there is a sense in which there is a coming kingdom of God. And that, of course, we know is going to happen. When Christ returns, He destroys the wicked, a new heaven, a new earth, the new Jerusalem comes down, and Christ reigns. It talks about even there's not, we don't even going to need the sun because the Lamb of God will illumine us. That is the coming kingdom. So there is a sense in Scripture when this term is used that it's speaking of this coming kingdom, this coming reality. And then he says, it is at hand. In other words, it's in your midst. We know he used that same, uh, he used a phrase similar in, in John 17, uh, um, uh, Luke 17, excuse me, Luke 17, 11. When he tells, uh, he, he says, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Brethren, right now, we are in the kingdom of God. Christ is reigning as king. We are his servants. And it's growing. When we preach the gospel, we are preaching a gospel of the kingdom. When I stand in this pulpit or on the streets and I'm preaching the gospel, this is a gospel of the kingdom of God because we are inviting lost sinners to become citizens with the saints. That's exactly the same language Paul uses in Ephesians when he says, uh, and you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. And so we are in the kingdom of God and we're looking forward to the coming kingdom of God. And then at the end of uh, verse, verse 15, we find, uh, we find this one word. And that's the fourth point I would like to make this morning. And it is simply repentance. The doctrine of repentance after Jesus says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. And there's surely more that He said. I mean, obviously we know His preaching contained a lot more. But Mark simply, obviously being the concise gospel writer he was, and writing a very shorter gospel than the others, only 16 chapters, he just condenses it and says, here's, here's the gist of his message. Time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. And then we get to the application part. We get to the use section, as the Puritans used to call it. We get to the part where Jesus cuts to the heart. And he says, okay, king, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Here's what you must do. Repent. That's the first thing. And that's the fourth point I want to make. Repent. But we ask ourselves, what is repentance? Well, let's dig down to the original languages in the Greek. The word here is metaneo or metanoia in a different form. And metanoia simply means to change one's mind, to change one's thinking. Uh, meta, uh, for example, we get the word metamorphosis, which again carries with it the idea of change. And the noia is thinking or mind. So the call of the gospel is repent, and that means to change one's mind. But what are we changing our minds concerning? What is changing about our minds or our thinking or our understanding? Well, it's a lot of things. One, it's concerning sin. Um, another, it's concerning Christ. Uh, concerning sin in our own lives. There's many things that, that it changes in the mind of someone who's born again when repentance takes place. But when we look in Scripture, mainly the word repentance carries with it the idea of sin. Repentance typically deals with sin. And that's the first thing. Someone must see their sin and see their bankruptcy, see their spiritual bankruptcy before God, see their helplessness, that they cannot justify themselves by their religious works. And an aspect of, of repentance is apprehending Christ, is seeing the Savior for sin. The New Testament is filled. I mean, it is packed with references to repentance. In fact, it's been, it's been called by theologians the first word of the gospel. And I would agree with them. It's the first word of the gospel. The first word that protrudes out of the mouth of the preachers of the gospel in the first century. Jesus, Peter, Paul, was repent. Uh, Jesus said in, in Luke 13, 3, He said, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Verse 5, just two verses later, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You who are lost here today, I tell you no. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish in your sins. Later on in the apostolic preaching of the apostles, in, in Acts chapter 2, which is obviously, if you're familiar with Scripture, you're going to know this passage, because it's one of the most famous sermons in the New Testament where Paul, pre, uh, excuse me, Peter preaches the gospel to the men of Israel. But listen, at the, end, at the end of his preaching, right after he's done preaching, 
In verse 37, it says this. Acts 2.37. Now when they, and now that would be the Jewish people, when they heard this, that would be a Peter's sermon, they were pierced to the heart. I'll just stop right there. You know, what? one aspect of biblical preaching is it pierces to the heart. It deals with the heart. Preaching that does not deal with the heart is not preaching. It's got to get to the heart. The truth is like a sharp sword. As the Bible says that. In, uh, in Hebrews 4.12, the, the Word of God is, a, is like a, a two-edged sword dividing the so, um, uh, to soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. But he continues, he says, Luke writes, They were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? This is every preacher's dream. To preach a sermon and then you hear the audience, What shall we do? In verse 38, Peter said to them, Did he say believe? What did he say? Repent! And each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of, of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Friends, the first word of the gospel is that you must flee your sin. Your mind must change concerning your sin. See, a lot of times people talk about repentance. They say, oh, you've got to turn from sin. That is true. But that's really the outworking of repentance. Repentance is the, is the change of belief concerning sin. See, it's not about, again, uh, all things in Scripture, it's not about this outward conformity. It's about the heart. It cuts to the heart. What is, what, what do you, in your mind, what do you think concerning sin? Are you disgusted with it? Are you, do you detest sin? Are you, are you fed up with your own sin? Are you broken? That is a, a repentant heart. That is what genuine repentance is. And that will, that will evidence in turning from sin. So to be technical when we speak of repentance, it is the, it's the heart. It's the change of the heart and the mind. Also, we know from the book of Acts later on, in, in, even in Paul's preaching ministry, he said this concerning his, his preaching. He's speaking to the elders at Ephesus in Acts 20. He says in verse 20, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. If you ask Peter, if you ask Paul, if you ask our Lord Jesus, what is the first word of the gospel? The, re- the consistent answer is going to be repent. Repent. God desires that sinners repent. In the, in the prescriptive will of God, it is, it is put forth that sinners are to repent. God desires it. It is something that God desires and demands of the sinner. It is not something that is optional. At all. In fact, uh, God spoke through Ezekiel in Ezekiel 18, verse 30. God spoke through Ezekiel. He said, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, each according to his conduct, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn away from all your transgressions, so that iniquity may not become a stumbling block to you. Cast away from you all your transgressions which you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Listen listen to the heart of God come out in this. Oh, why will you die? Listen to verse 32. For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. Therefore, repent and live. God does not take pleasure in the damnation of the wicked. However, in His jealous desire for holiness and in His jealous desire for justice, He surely will. Jesus Himself said, God destroys the soul and the body in hell. However, God's hand is stretched forth saying, Come, all you who are weary, come and have life. Repent, for I do not take pleasure in the death of anyone who dies. Also, lastly, so now we have a good idea of of repentance and its definition and what it actually is. I would like to briefly consider the source of repentance. In other words, where does it come from? Is repentance something that we muster up within us? Is it an act of the will? Is it something that is found in the heart of man and he simply must activate it? I tell you no. 2 Timothy 2.24 says, The Lord's bond servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God might 
Grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. Repentance originates from God. God grants to the sinner the gift of repentance. In fact, I like the way the the London Baptist Confession words it. If I remember correctly, it talks about it being an evangelical grace. In other words, it's something God gives to us in His grace. He grants it to us. It is not something we can give to ourselves or muster up within the soul. It is a gift from God. A change of mind and heart is something that only God can wrought within the man by the power of the Holy Spirit. If man could change himself, there would be no need for salvation. But as it is, man is dead in sin, and he is dead in all of his sin, and he loves his sin and hates God, as Romans 1.30 tells us. And so God, therefore, has to invade the castle of his transgressions and destroy the idols which he worships and raise him to spiritual life and cause him to be born anew. And therefore, repentance is certainly the gift of God. Lastly, the fifth point I would like to make from these two verses is concerning faith or belief. And that is what Jesus says at the end there. He says, repent and believe in the gospel. That is the second thing the sinner must do. They must believe the gospel. Again, as we did with repentance, let's dig down a little deeper into the Greek word. And the Greek word that's used here is pistuo. Pistuo, and it's related to the word pistis, which is translated faith in the New Testament. So they're very similar words. They're, they're synonymous. Belief and faith, of course, are synonymous. And they're derived from one another in Greek. But a pistis is derived from pytho, another Greek word. And pytho means to persuade or to win someone's friendship. So the idea is, from the Greek, the idea with with, with faith and with belief is it is a holy persuasion concerning the gospel message. It is where the Spirit of God persuades, gives gives the believer a persuasion concerning the truth of Christ that they see Jesus is Savior, He has come, He is truly real, He has died for sin, and He has died not just for sinners, but for me. Saving faith is a personal thing. It is something that it's something we see Christ, we apprehend Christ, and we grab hold of Christ for ourselves. Saving faith is the instrument by which we grab hold of salvation. And obviously, as we are very familiar with, the call of the gospel, the call to believe, is found all throughout Scripture. One of the most famous parts is in John 3. When Jesus says in verse 16, which is very, a very famous passage, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Verse 17, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. Listen to verse 18. Listen to the contrast. He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. As with repentance, if there's a lack of belief, there's a lack of salvation. If there's a lack of a repentant heart, there's a, it's a lack of a regenerate heart. And so if you don't have faith, you're not going to see God. What, what does Hebrews tell us? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. It's impossible. Later on in the book of Romans, uh, as Martin Luther called it, the purest gospel... We find so much data, so much data in this one book concerning faith that there is too much for me to look at. But I'll just do a brief overview. Uh, one, one, one such passage is in Romans 3.28. Paul says simply, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Salvation is by faith. Uh, later on in, in of chapter 4 verse 3, he quotes Genesis 15.6. He says, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Two verses later, but to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. We find uh, both words there, belief and faith. They're synonymous. Chapter five, verse one, therefore, having been justified by faith. I think we are picking up the, the, the pattern here that's put forth in scripture. One must repent and believe the gospel. It is important for me to also note here 
That repentance and faith are inexorably tied to one another. They are, they are, they are sisters. And they cannot be in any way not related to one another. The one builds upon the other. The one is, is related to another and attached and cannot be removed. Some theologians have tried and speculated as to which one in terms of salvation, which one comes first? Do you believe first or do you repent first? I would go, from, I would go with the persuasion that they both happen simultaneously. For they are so intertwined and built upon one another, one cannot precede another. For example, we repent concerning that which we believe in, and we believe in that which we repent concerning. See, they're built upon one another. There cannot be one without another. And so that's why it's foolish for a preacher to say, well, all you have to do is believe. There's no, you don't have to repent. A lie. That's a lie. Such a belief that a preacher is talking about that includes no repentance is no belief at all. And even for the... I don't think any preachers would say this, but maybe there are some who say you repent, but you don't have to believe. Surely they're foolish as well. For you cannot repent concerning that which you do not believe in and you do not have a, a persuasion concerning. In fact, I love what Matthew Henry said, the famous Bible commentator on this passage. He said in verse 15, upon verse 15, he said this, By repentance we must lament and forsake our sins, and by faith we must receive the forgiveness of them. By repentance we must give glory to our Creator, whom we have offended. By faith we must give glory to our Redeemer, who came to save us from our sins. Both these must go together. We must not think either. That reforming our lives will save us without trusting in the righteousness and grace of Christ. Or that trusting in Christ will save us without the reformation of our hearts and lives. Christ hath joined these two together and let no man put them asunder. They will mutually assist and befriend one another. Repentance will quicken faith and faith will make repentance evangelical. And the sincerity of both together must be evidenced by a diligent, conscientious obedience to all God's commandments. Thus the preaching of the gospel began, and thus it continues. Still, the call is, repent and believe, and live a life of repentance and a life of faith. I could not have said it better myself. I think about right after I was converted, I myself was somewhat infatuated. Dad, you remember this. I was infatuated with repentance, with studying concerning the doctrine. And it was not because I had necessarily an unhealthy obsession with it or anything like that. But it was a joyful discovery of the blessed gift of repentance. For after I was converted, I realized that that's, that's what happened in my heart. God had granted me repentance and thereby true faith. Not some pseudo-false faith, but a genuine, spirit-wrought faith in the gospel. We know out of the book of Numbers that for someone not to believe and for someone not to apprehend the truth of Scripture by faith is a great evil. God told Moses and Aaron that they would not enter the promised land. Now these are believers. He said, because you did not believe me. Unbelief is a serious evil in the eyes of God. Even for a believer. Even for someone who possesses faith, when they find themselves doubting the promises of God, it is not something that is just simply a struggle, but it is something that is a sinful offense. It is sinful to doubt the promises of God, brethren. It is a sinful thing to reject the testimony of God. How, is salvation, how does salvation happen? We believe... The promises of God. How do we continue on in faith? We continue to believe the promises of God. That is all of what Romans 4 is about. And I wish I could continue uh, through that passage uh, as I looked over a, a couple of texts there earlier. I wish I could look through the whole chapter because it's all about the life of faith. A exam uh, the example was given was Abraham. Abraham at one time believed. Boy, he, what did he continue to do? Believe, believe, believe. In fact, uh, scholars believe, Genesis 15, 6, when it says, and he believed in the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Scholars believe, and I'm under the persuasion as well, that that was not the first time Abraham believed. For if you translate the Hebrew, it actually reads, and he kept on believing in the Lord. I believe that when um, Moses, or excuse me, not Moses, but when Abraham tr truly first believed God was actually in Genesis 12. 
when it's recorded that God promised him a seed and a nation and a land, and it says in the next verse, he got up and he left. I believe that was when Abraham was saved. Because what was the evidence of it? He, he acted. He walked. He lived according to his faith. If someone says they know Christ, they're going to live according to the faith they have, if it's genuine. Yesterday, as I encountered person after person through door knocking, and even I see it all the time on the streets, it's, it's like every person. It's almost as if I don't even have to ask him anymore. I just like, I always just want to say now, each person I meet, you're a false convert, you're lost, please repent and believe. Next person. Because it, this is over and over and over, or people I run into, they grow up in church, their parents are Christians, they themselves are a deacon or whatever, and you ask them a simple question like, if you died today and you stood before God, where would you go? Oh, well, I'd go to heaven. Oh, why should God let you into heaven? Because I'm a good person. I've been to church. I've tried my best. I pray. I'm, I'm really, I worship God. These are serious answers. I'm not kidding you, brethren. I get these answers all the time. Very rarely do I hear someone say, Oh, I'm a sinner. I've sinned. I see my sin. I see it. I hate it. I'm disgusted with it. I know I deserve hell, but Christ bled for me. Upon the cross, He propitiated. I don't have to use that word necessarily. But He satisfied the wrath of God for me. Jesus died for me. I'm going to heaven. I just want to embrace people. I just want to give them a hug. Because I'm like, yes, yes, you see it. You see your poverty. What did Jesus say? Blessed are the poor in spirit. You realize Jesus wasn't saying, actually, people who are poor in spirit. Because everyone's poor in spirit. What that means is those who recognize their poverty of spirit. We're all poor wretches. We're all beggars. We're all spiritually dried up. Christ is the bread that came down from heaven. Jesus is the Savior. And it is those who are blessed are the ones who see their spiritual poverty and repent and believe the gospel. In closing, he brings it in verse, at the end of verse 15 and says, In the gospel, repent and believe the gospel. As I said earlier, I would like to take you to one more passage of Scripture. If you would turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we find one of the most precious passages in all of Scripture. I think every Christian ought to put this text to heart and mind. He begins in verse 1 by telling the Corinthians, He says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. This is the Gospel. And this is the Gospel that Jesus called sinners to believe. You may say, well, Jesus hadn't died yet. Oh, oh friend, the Gospel is sprinkled throughout the Old Testament. There is enough light there that no one could walk away from reading the Old Testament and say, I knew not the Gospel. As I said earlier, Isaiah 53, Isaiah 11, the Psalms, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 23, 6, and this is a name by which you will be called Yahweh to sit canoe, the Lord our righteousness. Uh, Genesis 3, 15, I said it earlier. It is all about Christ. It's pointing to Him. They knew the Gospel. The Jewish people had the light of Holy Scripture. They had the inspired Word of God. They had the Old Covenant texts. And yet they were blind. And yet they could not see the gospel because of their spiritual blindness. But nonetheless, Christ calls them to believe it. To believe what the prophets spoke. This gospel is of utter necessity. The gospel of Jesus Christ is of utter necessity, friends. Because of the holiness of God. Because of the righteousness of the character of God. Who God is. God is 
holy, holy, holy. Isaiah 6, when Isaiah has the vision of the Lord seated on His throne in heaven, he sees the, the, the two angels covering up themselves and crying out to one another, holy, holy, holy. And so in God's holiness, we know from old, the Old Testament, and even from the teaching and preaching of Jesus, that God gave His law. He gave His commands. We know the command, you shall not lie or steal or dishonor your parents for you young ones in here. We shall not blaspheme. But what have we done? Our hands are dirty. Our souls are covered in sin. Friends, we have broken the law of God. We have transgressed the covenant of works. Just like our, our, our father Adam, the head of the human race. Praise God, another one has taken his place. Who is the head of the people of God, Christ. But nonetheless, we have broken the law. And we deserve God's punishment for our sin. We deserve wrath. We deserve hell. As Jesus said, it is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. He said it is a place of outer darkness. That is where we are consigned to. And that is why God had to enact this covenant of grace. That is why God had to bring about the glorious gospel which He owns, which He authored, and which is concerning Himself. That the second person of the Trinity, eternal God, came down and took upon Himself flesh and fulfilled the law that we broke. He lived in submission and obedience to the will of the Father. Something we could not do in and of ourselves. And He laid Himself down at the cross of Calvary as the Lamb of God. And He bore the wrath of God. Isaiah 53.10 It pleased the Lord to crush Him. It satisfied the wrath of the Father. As He said at the, at the cross to tell us die, it is finished, it's gone. Uh, uh, Mark 15, 38, the veil of the timber was, was ripped from top to bottom. It's done. Salvation has been completed for the people of God. And He was raised to life on the third day. And He is alive today, never to die again. Forty days later, what did He do? He went to the top of the Mount of Olives, ascended bodily into glory, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. And He now sits there and He lives to make intercession for those who draw near to God through Him. And as we have seen so clearly put forth in this text, the call of the Gospel is to repent and to believe it. And for the sinner who flees their sin, flees their, their self-trust and trust in Christ alone, that sinner receives pardon. Total pardon. Cleansing of iniquity. And the righteousness of Christ is a gift of grace. Gift righteousness. The Father looks at the sinner no longer as a sinner, but as a pardoned saint. And wrapped in the righteousness of His Son. Christ takes my sin, I receive His righteousness. Christ is credited with having broken the law. And I am credited with having kept it. Because He did it for me. That is the glory of the Gospel. It is all by the grace of God. And as we consider repentance and faith, the one who truly believes this is born from above genuinely and their life will bear fruit of that. And brethren, this is for us, not just for the lost. This is for the Christian. This is our manna from heaven. This is our daily bread. It is for no reason that all of Scripture testifies to the Gospel. It's because it ought to be upon our hearts and minds daily. We ought to be Gospel-centered as the preaching of our Lord Jesus was Gospel-centered. It is all by the grace of God and all to the glory of God. It redounds to His glory. It redounds to the glory of God. And He is worthy of it. He is worthy of the glory that is brought to Him through the preaching of the gospel of grace. So I exhort you, I exhort you, you lost souls, to flee to Christ and to trust alone in Him, whether you're religious or not. If you say you know Christ, I, I encourage you to examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith, to see whether you perhaps are just like those people that I spent yesterday afternoon speaking with. Those people who say they have Christ, but they are full of dead men's bones inside, who are simply hypocrites. In that case, the call is still the same. Repent and believe the Gospel. And even for you believers, even my fellow saints, the sheep of the flock of God, brethren, the call is even the same for you. Continue repenting and continue believing. Just as our Lord Jesus called it. We are to continue doing so. As, as, as Abraham did, then he continued to believe in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Brethren, let us continue to walk 
the path of faith and the path of repentance, resisting the world, the flesh, and the devil by the power that God supplies through His Spirit. So we have seen here in Mark 1, 14 and 15, that Christ's preaching was gospel-centered, that it spoke of His perfect fulfillment of the Old Testament texts, and the rightness, the perfection of the time in which He came. It was concerning the kingdom of God. It was concerning repentance. And it was concerning faith, belief in the gospel. And we have seen that though we have sinned, God has sent the Savior of sin, the Savior for sinners. The gospel, concisely put, is Jesus saves sinners. To God be the glory for this glorious gospel of grace. I will let the Apostle Paul have the last word. Out of Romans 16, in verse 25, he says, Now, to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith, to the only wise God through Jesus Christ be the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I ask now that the, as the Word of God has gone forth, that You would bless it. That we would all be transformed by the truth, by the, by the powerful, life-changing message of the Gospel. And as we meditate upon these texts of Scripture this afternoon, I pray that those of us who know You would grow in grace. And maybe, Father, if you so desire, I pray that you would work on the hearts of the unconverted in this room, that they would believe, that they would repent, something which you only can do. And Father, I pray you be glorified in us. We praise you. Oh God, how we praise you for your grace you've shown in the gospel, the gospel of grace. Amen and amen.